We greet all of you tonight. In the name of the Lord, I always delight in being with the saints of God. Amen. It does something for my spirit that uh, no other human association can do. We, of course, welcome our, our fellow, fellow brethren on live stream also. This will be our a 67th lesson in Genesis. We're going to be in, begin in chapter 40, 42 tonight. Very important things to see. We'll be reviewing the first 20 verses. Now, when Jacob saw that there was corn in Egypt, Jacob said unto his sons, Why do ye look one on another? And he said, Behold, I have heard that there is corn in Egypt. Get you down thither and buy for us from thence that we may live and not die. And Joseph's ten brethren went down to buy corn in Egypt. But Benjamin, Joseph's brother, Jacob sent not with his brethren. For he said, Lest peradventure mischief befall him. And the sons of Israel came to buy corn among those that came. For the famine was in the land of Canaan, and Joseph was the governor over the land, and he it was that sold all the people of the land. And Joseph's brethren came and bowed down themselves before him with their faces to the earth. And Joseph saw his brethren, and he knew them, but made himself strange unto them, span spake roughly unto them. He said unto them, Whence come ye? They said, From the land of Canaan to buy food. Joseph knew his brethren, but they did, but they knew him not. And Joseph remembered the dreams which he dreamed of them, and said unto them, Ye are spies to see the nakedness of the land are ye come. They said unto him, Nay, my Lord. But to buy food are thy servants come. We're all one man's sons. We're true men. Thy servants are no spies. He said unto them, Nay, but to see the nakedness of the land ye are come. And they said, Thy servants are twelve brethren, the sons of one man in the land of Canaan. And behold, the youngest is this day with our father, and one is not. And Joseph said unto them, that is it that I spake unto you, saying, Ye are spies. Herewithal shall ye be proved. By the life of Pharaoh ye shall not go thence, forth thence, except your youngest brother come hither. Send one of you, let him fetch your brother. Ye shall be kept in prison, that your words may be proved, whether there be any truth in you. <coughs> <coughs> or else by the life of Pharaoh, surely you are spies. And he put them all together into ward three days. Joseph said unto them the third day, This do and live, for I fear God. If ye be true men, let one of your brethren be bound in the house of your prison. Go ye, carry corn for the famine of your houses. But bring your youngest brother to me, so shall your words be verified, and ye shall not die. And they did so. Amen. Well, that's kind of an abbreviated account. You can only imagine some of the thoughts and so forth that went on during that time. Now, for some people in the world, not for all people, for some people in the world, God works everything together for good. He, he doesn't do this for everybody, and, and we shouldn't tell people he does. Amen. Just to those that love him and are called according to his purpose. Amen. As we care about this, God is not working happenstance together and coincidence 
for the good of those who are the call according to his purpose. He doesn't take this and that random happenings and throw them all together and make them turn out right. That's not, uh, that's not what he's doing. He's not taking random occurrences, occurrences pressing them together like clay and turn, make, make them turn out to your good. God either personally sends things as he did in sending manna. He pers personally sent manna to him. And bread and meat to eat sent by way of the ravens to Elijah. Or he allows another one to bring it as he did the case of Job. Satan brought the trial. Peter, Satan brought the trial. In Israel, the things involved, it's working together for good. Involved the oppression of the Egyptians, the mighty deliverance from them. If you talk about the early disciples, God is working. So he's working in doing them with the power from on high and suffering while suffering the opposition of men. He's still working everything. You can't look at the circumstances and come up to this conclusion. There are people today who are teaching this. And just to clear the air, I am an opponent of these people. They teach people who can tell outwardly. You got a lot of wealth, a lot of things. everything's going out, working out fine for them. And that's proof that God's for them. No, it's not. It's not at all. Now, things God is teaching us some some things in life, just like He was teaching these people. These were rudimentary lessons they were learning, but they were necessary to be learned. For instance, Paul said, and I've learned, I've learned that whatever state I'm in, therewith to be content. I learned that. I say I, I learned that. Amen. I know how to be abased. I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and suffer need. And I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. See, so in Christ, all valid teaching comes from the Lord. It does not come from your circumstances. Yeah, that's right. It comes from the Lord. Yeah. Circumstance itself can't teach you. Mm -hmm. Circumstance itself is mute. Mm -hmm. There has to be the Holy Spirit, God, there has to be some agent to speak through it to you. So God is teaching, working everything together, working it. And I want to mention some of the things now he's worked uh, together for Joseph. He received a special coat from Jacob. He received a special favor from Jacob. He was hated by his brothers. <coughs> he had two informative dreams. He was hated by his brothers when he told them his dreams. When sent by his father to find his brothers, he couldn't find them. A stranger directed him to his brothers. His brothers took his coat from him with the intention of killing him and threw him into a pit. They drew him out, draw him out of the pit, draw him out of the pit and sell him to a band of Ishmaelites. He is purchased by Potiphar, captain of the Egyptian king's guard. Potiphar makes him the head of his house. Potiphar's wife attempts to allure him into adultery. Upon his refusal, she concocts a lie against him, and he goes to prison. Upon hearing the lie, Potiphar imprisons him. Joseph is chained and shackled, but he's made the head of the prisoners. He interprets special dreams had by fellow prisoners. He asks the butler to remember him before Pharaoh when he got out of prison. After two years on, on Pharaoh's birthday, and upon hearing Pharaoh had two dreams, the butler finally remembered Joseph and informs him that he interprets dreams. Pharaoh calls for Joseph. Joseph interprets the dreams. Joseph tells Pharaoh what course to, of action to take. Pharaoh makes Joseph the head of the land and puts him in charge of managing the grain. 
Now I ask you, who but God could take that and work it all together for good? Now your, your case is probably just the same if you were to really look into it, which you should. You'll find out God is saying that where you thought were against you. Well, lo and behold, they contributed to your faith. See, the, the ultimate design of God is to teach us about his salvation, what it takes to save a man. To save a man, God's got to work all things together for his good. This has to happen. If he's a sinner, he's got to work that, got to work that out. And he does through Christ Jesus. Think about how he draws men to himself. He saves them, he calls them, he keeps them. The things that happen to them is illustrated in the life of Paul fall out to the furtherance of the gospel. This is what God is doing. He did, he did it with Abraham. He did it with Noah. He did it with all, all of the patriarchs all up here. He did this. This is how we're to think about our salvation, correlating these records with apostolic doctrine and human experience. We put it all together and begins to make sense. All right, here's the here's the picture. There's a famine in the land of Canaan. It's consumed the land. <coughs> but Jacob, he's alert. He's alert. He's not uh, weeping behind the barn someplace. He's alert. He saw there was corn in Egypt. See in. With Israel, he gave them manna. Manna came to them. And to uh, Elijah, he sent ravens that brought the bread to him. <laughs> he made a willow, widow's barrel of meal keep on increasing and a, bear, and a cruise of oil. When the multitudes followed Jesus and became hungry, he just miraculously gave them bread. But this is not how he provided for Jacob and his sons. <laughs> God doesn't do it this way all the time. <laughs> And if you proceed in life as though he does, you'd be disappointed. Yeah. This case, the food was supplied in another country. You're going to have to take a long trip to pick it up. You didn't have a bus that dropped it by, a caravan dropped it by. You had to go get it. Well, you've got to see now what we're talking about here. You've got to see it's still the same way. Well, the believers that learn that spiritual nourishment does not come easily. Some people, as the scriptures say, pine away. They just can't find a place where they get something. They just, they just pine away about it. Sometimes you have to get up and go get it where it's supplied. Amen. That's, that's what they had to do. Mm-hmm. Jacob saw there was corn in Egypt. Mm-hmm. How, how did he see that? Well, the famine was in Canaan, so there must have been some neighbors or someone that had got corn, or maybe some travelers mm-hmm. went through Canaan, and they had this corn. Hey, well, hey, where'd you get that corn? Yeah, uh-huh, yeah. Now, you want to pick up on uh, <coughs> maintaining your spiritual life here, what's, what's involved in it. <coughs> Again, it means these hungry people, they talk to one another. These people couldn't find anything to eat. They talked to one another. Yeah. Pretty soon, some say, "Hey, hey, I, I found some corn. I know where you can get. I know where you can get yeah. some corn." Yeah. Jacob moves right into action. Yeah. Says, "I hear there's corn in, in Egypt. We're gonna go down there." Now, there's still a lot of people in Christ who are suffering from malnutrition of the soul. Yes. Yeah. They're unable to obtain nourishment on their own, at least not on any consistent basis. They may even hear of some souls that have found corn, but they don't ask, like, where. Instead, they stand about and look at each other like Jacob's sons did. Poor souls. As yet, they're unaware they can go where the food's being served and get some. That's the way the kingdom of God. You were how many people had to go to Canaan when Jesus was here? How many people had to go to Canaan if they wanted to hear Jesus? He didn't go to Rome, Italy, Greece. He didn't go there. They had to come here, here, to hear him where he was at. But they are willing to do that. 
Sometimes you see we're, we're fed without any labor at all. Like the, with the manna, just had to pick it up. After you had to pick it up. Sometimes you, you have to sow and reap a harvest. Sometimes that happens. Sometimes you're sent to someone else who'll sustain you, like Elijah was sent to a widow to sustain her. Sometimes the Lord sends adequate supplies to you personally. Sometimes you have to labor for the meat that endures into eternal life. You've got to learn to distinguish those times. Part of spiritual growth involves coming to a point where you know what to do to obtain nourishment for your soul. Amen. You just, you know what to do. Some people, they don't know what to do. They just studied the Bible harder. You know. And there's certainly nothing wrong with that. But Enoch could have studied all the way back to Ethiopia, and he'd have never known what that text that Isaiah meant. That's right. He'd have someone that knew explained yeah. it to him. Amen. Part of spiritual growth involves coming to a point where you know where to obtain nourishment, and you go for it. Amen. So I said to his boys, I've heard, I've heard, I've heard. That, that sentence is used... 34 times in scriptures, I've heard, I've heard. There comes a time when he, hearing something, your life hangs on it. Hearing something, I've, I've heard. Several times in the introduction to some kind of change, news that changed a person's posture in life came and readied them for some experience they were going to have. One time God spoke, you know, and the people thought, did you hear it thunder? It thundered. One of the greatest disadvantages of living in an era of multitudinous distractions is the effect it has on your hearing. I see this. It happens a lot in young people. They're not the only ones, but they're so distracted. They can't really get down to saving their soul. Yeah. Amen. Busy with other things, right. having fun. You think of the official from Canaan. Son <coughs> That's right. Or the centurion. That's right. Or the Gentile woman. Yes. Mm -hmm. Traveled for miles to That's find right. where he was. Mm -hmm. That's right. Or the right. poor friends who brought their friend. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They didn't have any regrets. Did All they? Of these people hearing and then looking and seeking and dropping everything else and going to find him. Mm -hmm. See, the Lord draws people, but the only way you know if he's drawn them or not is if they come. Amen. Amen. <laughs> so they came. So he says, there's corn in Egypt. What are you doing standing there looking at each other? They must have been forlorn, you know, cast down. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? We looked out the barns, all empty, Dad. There's nothing here. No seed. What are we going to do? I said, stop looking at each other. I've heard there's corn. Let's, let's get down Let's get down hither to Canaan. It, it was an urgency in what he said. He wasn't saying, as soon as you can, go to Canaan. He told him, get down there right away. <coughs> now, Egypt was south of Canaan, which is northwest. So it was, uh, I figure it could have been as much as 200 miles by camel or by caravan, you know. Quite a long time. Go down and buy for us. Now, just go down and feed yourself. You get enough. You got got to bring enough food back for us. Yeah. All here, buy for us from thence. Joseph doesn't specify how much. He assumes the boys have been trained properly. They know how much we're going to require. And he tells them why. Why to do this that we may live. Yeah. This, this is our life we're talking about here. And when it comes to the uh, things of God, I'm afraid that a lot of people do not know that their life is at stake. Amen. That's right. I, don't, I don't think they're too casual. That's right. They're too casual. They're too disinterested. They don't invest enough of themselves in it. I, I don't think they know 
what's at stake here. We may live. That's the objective, to live. When it comes to spiritual life, <coughs> living is not as simplistic as in the earth. Now, there's a, there's a religious culture has been developed in the professed Christendom that is flawed to the core. It's this, that in times of spiritual malnutrition, the people seek only for instant and temporary solutions and gratification. Just, just knock the appetite off for the moment. They don't think of the long term. All entertainers, see, all athletic enthusiasts, I'm not against these things, understand. But everything they offer is short term. It's not lasting. Mm -hmm. It's not lasting. Amen. The world can't give you something that lasts. The Lord knows you need something that lasts. The salvation of God is not intended to be a quick fix. I think sometimes it's approached as though that was the case, but it's not. Salvation is not a quick fix. Amen. Being justified from all things is a long-term thing. Yes, right. All things becoming new is a long-term. Old things, be all things, old things becoming old. Receiving the Spirit of God. All these things that happen when you're saved, when you're saved, reconciled to God, justified from all things. That's intended to be for a lifetime. That's Amen. not intended to be something that happened here and then you're like a vaccinated, yeah, right. inoculated and you're immune to everything. That's not what it's like at all. <laughs> the scripture talks about eternal life, eternal <laughs> salvation, eternal weight of glory. A house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens, eternal redemption, eternal inheritance, everlasting consolation. See, these are no one should be surprised that you've got to extend yourself to get these things. No one should be surprised at that. And you need them. You need all these, all of these things. So you go down to Egypt, he says, and, and get some corn. <coughs> so they went down, Joseph's ten brothers, but they left Benjamin at home. Now notice here it says Joseph's brothers. It doesn't say Jacob's sons. Huh? You picked up on that, I'm sure. Joseph's brothers, not Jacob's sons. Later, when the whole family migrates to Egypt, they are called Jacob's sons. But at this point here, the language reflects a change in emphasis concerning individuals in the book of Genesis. From this verse to the end of Genesis, Joseph is mentioned 84 times. Jacob is mentioned 31 times, and he's referred to as Israel 30 times. Joseph is referred to in regards to the brothers obtaining corn from Genesis 41, 3 to 44, 15. That's the record of that. The record of Joseph revealing himself is from 45, 1 to 45, 8. <coughs> Joseph's word to bring Jacob and his family to Egypt extends from Genesis 45, 9 to 45, 24. The point I'm establishing is that the emphasis is on the group now. Yeah, uh -huh. It's been on individuals. Beginning with Adam and all the way down to Abraham, was Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, it was all on individuals. Yeah. But the emphasis is going to switch. Yeah. Now, <laughs> the report of the brothers to Jacob extends from Genesis 45, 25 to 45, 28. Jacob's journey with his family and belongings is recorded in Genesis 46, 1 through 27. The record of Joseph meeting them, giving them some directions, and the welcome to Pharaoh is from 46, 28 to 47, 12. The record of Joseph distributing the grain to Egypt and the manner in which it was done is found in Genesis 47, 13 and 42, 47, 26. The multiplication of the Israelites is mentioned in Genesis 45:27. The blessing of Jacob upon his sons 
is recorded in Genesis 45, 28 through 50, 21. The remainder of Joseph's life together with his death and burial are recorded in Genesis 50, 22 through 50, 26. So there's a shift yeah. in emphasis, yes. Yeah. Another perspective of that shift also. It's not like the, uh, the relation to Jacob is dismissed, but now their lives have to do with the reference to Joseph. It, they, everything was underneath Jacob before, but now it's Joseph with yes. whom they have to do. And uh, he becomes a, a preeminent factor in their survival. Amen. Mm -hmm. I list some things there that confirm this. It's quite a remarkable shift yeah. from a, individuals mm -hmm. to a group. The next individual that it will fasten on for a, a season is David, but then Christ is the final one. He, yeah. The emphasis settles on Christ. <coughs> there are also a number of individuals associated with God's working in these key figures, and I named some here. Some are enemies, some are friends, but wherever their life touched the life of someone, whether it was the man's son molested Jacob's daughter, or Abimelech wanted Abraham's wife. Wherever, whoever they, their lives touched, a note was made of it. A note was made of it. Now you've got to trust in God still doing this. You've got to trust this. When things go bad for you, and if you live for a while, that'll happen. You may wonder why, 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 why is it going bad? God's taking note of this. Amen. All of this. He's got all things together for your good and for his ultimate mm -hmm. being justified in all of his sayings. Now, all of these people, I just named a few of them, their lives were managed by God. Yes. Amen. Hmm? Mm -hmm. Down to the finest detail, their lives were managed by God. None of them lived unto themselves, yeah. strictly speaking. <coughs> <coughs> Now the purpose is, God is developing here, is the seed of a woman, seed of the woman, he's told right off, right off in the garden, the seed of the woman is the bruise the head of the serpent. So he's developing this, how this seed's gonna come into the world. Seed's gonna come into the world through a special woman who is in a special race, who is fathered by a special man, miraculously. And the Messiah is going to be raised in a culture. It's unlike any culture in the world. Yeah. So that's where the attention is being focused. And secondly, it's a great nation. He's developing a great nation. At this point, the total count of the Israelites were 70. Mm -hmm. That's not a great nation. But it's going to be before he's through. It's going to be. Then there's a global blessing. He's going to bless all families of the earth. Be blessed. See, this God's told you where, he, where he's headed. He's God, so nothing's going to thwart this for him from doing this. He's not going to fall short of his objective. That scripture says Benjamin wasn't, wasn't sent. He's kept at home. Not just because he was young. He was the youngest, but he is a child of his old age like Joseph was and he was a child of Rachel a wife that he loved and he's especially close to Benjamin the, he remembered what happened to Joseph when he what he thought happened to Joseph when he left home he said, I couldn't bear the thought of this happening to Benjamin too so he kept him home he was the only remaining child of Rachel the woman whom he loved now, at this time, Jacob was about 130 years old. Shortly after this, he'll appear before Pharaoh, and Pharaoh will say, how old are you? He'll say, 130. So he's about 130 years old. Later, he'll confess this. He'll say to Pharaoh, few and evil have been the days of the years of my life. I went through a knot hole, let me tell you, Pharaoh. I've had a lot of sorrow. 
There's a lot of people can say this, but they don't let it overcome them. See, they don't let it overcome them. I don't doubt that he had to tell Pharaoh that. I don't think he wore his feelings on his coat sleeve, so to speak. It's good to seek to maintain the ability to reason soundly and be comforted and encouraged regarding how many hardships you went through and what they were for. If you'll examine your hardships, you'll be able to see a purpose in them all Amen. that only you will understand. You can see where he checked you here, he checked you there, he cut this off from you, brought that to you. You'll, you'll see it. So he sends the sons of his sons, the brethren of Joseph, to Egypt to buy grain. And they came to buy corn. That's why they came. They didn't come to be entertained. They didn't come to go to the latest athletic event. Their lives were at stake, see. Mm -hmm. Their lives were at stake. There are matters that are to be addressed in view of the fact that we are brethren. Said so we're brethren. We're we're buying bread for our whole family, and there are matters to be addressed in view of the whole family. There are matters that have have to do with us being the brethren of Jesus. Yes, amen. See, they're not so much that we're related to each other as that we're all related to Jesus, and there are some things that that's the most important consideration. And there's some matters that we're because we're the sons of God. So there's different layers of why we seek uh, sustenance from the Lord. This is why no apostle ever addressed believers as Christians. It's interesting, but because that's too generic. I know it's a fond, people like to use this term. They like it. It means of Christ. Not that it's wrong. I mean, it's not that it's wrong. It's just it's not the term of preference for Because it has more to do with your profession than what you actually are. While we're associated with one another, it is wholly because we're related to God. The only reason... We are Christians. It's because of our identity with God and Christ. It's not because we were just, we were baptized. That's not why. It's our relation to God and Christ that unites us to one another. Now, they were. It says that they went to Canaan. They were among those that came. <laughs> so there was a, a lot of people journeying to Canaan, because the famine was in Canaan, it made it up to Canaan, 200 miles away, the famine was there, and the surrounding countries too, and they joined them as an entourage, going, yeah. must have had some good talks along the way, went to buy corn. So there's uh, many people. Joseph has to administrate this. Yes. Huh? So I don't have a gift for business, and you don't want you managing the corn, that's for sure. Yes. What a sight this must have been, the, 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 this news to go out to all the land of all these grain bins yeah. that were filled with grain. Yeah. Somebody had thought ahead, yeah. and boy, this is quite a, quite a privilege. Joseph, he had, he had lived through all the hard times of, of piling it up, so to speak, yeah. and now he gets to do this part. This Amen. <laughs> among those that came to famine, among those that came for the fa came. Well, the famine was in the land of Canaan, and evidently in kind of in surrounding areas also. At least one version, in my judgment, misrepresents this text. Living Bible says they came with others from many lands. But I, I don't think that's what it means. It's true that people from other lands did come, but the emphasis is on Canaan. They were in Canaan. And where Jacob was located in Shechem, that was in the middle of Canaan. So he's talking about people focused in Canaan. There were some other people, but these are the people he particularly is focused on. 
and they came to Canaan for food. Keep in mind at this time the nation of Israel was only 66 people. And they, in Genesis 46, 26, it tells you that, 66. And if you count Jacob himself and Joseph and his wives, you'll come up with 70. 70 souls. People whom the ten sons journeyed were others from the land of Canaan. See, there were others from the land of Canaan. I think that meant a lot to these men. At the time of that land was promised to Abraham, there were a number of multiplicity of nations in the land. There were the Kenites and the Kenizzites and Cadmonites and the Hittites and Perizzites, Rephaims and Amorites and the Canaanites, the Girgashites, the Jebusites. When Joshua drove the nations out, <coughs> They were said to be the Canaanites, the Hivites, the Hittites, the Hivites, and the Perizzites, and Girgashites, and Amorites, and the Jebusites. So doubtless, some of these people were coming along. They were living in the land of Canaan, too. They, Jacob's clan was a minority. They were in the minority. There's a type seen here, a spiritual condition of the church, of the world is seen here. Sin has entered the world. And the spiritual famine has covered the face of the earth. Everybody's in need of the bread that only Jesus can give. Everybody. I'm not sure who it is. There's a sense in which every individual who comes to Jesus joins an exceedingly large group. There is no difference, as the scriptures say. Well, they finally get there. And Joseph was the governor of the land. They didn't, they didn't recognize him, didn't know who he was. Joseph was the governor of the land, and he it was that sold all people of the land. And Joseph's brethren came and bowed down, before, bowed down themselves before him with their faces to the earth. <clears throat> and the last time Joseph's brothers had seen him, he was 17 years old, And they despised him and just saw him carried away and sold to a caravan to Egypt. But God had intervened yes, in the affairs of men. Now you got to see this about God. We Christians have to bank on this. Yes. We have to bank on God intervening, yes. making things happen. Bank on that. He'll totally alter Joseph's circumstances. He's forced, for instance, God forced Adam and Eve out of the garden. He imposed a curse on Cain. He imposed a curse on the whole world in the flood. He separated Noah and his family from the rest of the world and saved them. He has governed the commencement and cessation of the flood. He has halted the unified efforts of the people of the plain of Shinar. He has caused Pharaoh's plans for Sarah to be aborted. He has caused Abraham to prosper. He brought about an abrupt end to the transgressions of Sodom and Gomorrah. He's caused the birth of Isaac under impossible circumstances. He's overturned the trickery of Laban. He's frustrated the intentions of Joseph's brothers. And now he has vaulted Joseph to be governor over all of Egypt. All right, that's the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's who that is. Yeah. It's the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. This isn't something God was. This is something he is. Amen. And if to get you home, he's got to raise up particular kings. He'll, I mean, he'll do this. You have to, you have to believe this. Yes. You have to count on this. Not a single one of these things could have been accomplished by man alone. Not a single one of them. There's one other thing to note. The perception or lack thereof of the brothers had nothing at all to do with the reality of the situation. The fact that his brothers didn't know what was going on didn't have anything to do with what was going on. <laughs> it, still, it still went on. What men think any man has no effect at all upon the purpose of God. It doesn't. He it was who sold. He it was that sold to all the people of the land personally. 
He so they had to present their case, how much they needed. Uh -huh. it, or I had to prove that this was what they needed. Uh -huh. And then he doled out the food to them. All this being directed by God. This is how particular God is. He didn't let other nations gobble up the grain. See? Under some circumstances, the other nations would have depleted the resources. That's right. Didn't let them do it. Mm -hmm. If any person or group of persons wanted corn or grain, they had to go to Joseph. It was Joseph's distract, dis, discretion that determined how much they got. Yeah. There were no black market sales. Yeah, that's right. No other resources because of the famine. <coughs> now we have a similar situation on our hands. <coughs> All the world is in the same boat, so to speak. By divine intention, a spiritual famine has enveloped the earth so that no spiritual resources are available from nature or the sons of men. Amen. That's the condition. Yeah. It's got to be obtained. they got to be obtained from Jesus. Nothing that pertains to life and godliness can be obtained anywhere else. Not in any program or any, nothing else. There are no humanly devised plans that can resolve the alienation from God that sin has caused. Amen. That's something that man's plans can't get into that area at all. There's no resource required to make men truly better. It doesn't come from Christ. I know it. I know it. It sounds simple, I understand, but... It isn't, because people are trying all kind of methodologies right. to do what Jesus only can do. Yeah, yeah. It won't work. Mm -hmm. So Joseph's brethren came and bowed down themselves before him. He didn't know who he really was, but they knew he was a, he was a leader. Good one, if you get that. Can you get you get that paper for me there? Thank you. Presented him, set themselves to him, bowed down before him. Total respect. Because of the general view that refuses to honor God-ordained authorities, yeah. this could not have happened in the United States. I'm going to give a little theology here. God told Daniel that in the days of these kings, which was the Babylonian Empire, Medio Persian Empire, Grecian, and Roman empires. In the days of those kings, he set up a kingdom that would never be destroyed. <clears throat> now, until that time, all kingdoms, no matter which kingdom they were, even the Chinese kingdom, were regional. They were not global, they were regional kingdoms. There wasn't a world kingdom. But God's going to establish a world kingdom going to cover the world so first what he does he duplicates on earth the kind of hierarchy that happens in his kingdom yes it was perverted yes people didn't use it right but the concept was there mm -hmm. so people knew you bowed down before dignitaries yeah, that's right. okay they knew that mm -hmm. now society to be valid must reflect eternal values I think you can see where I'm going here, that these men knew what to do when they came before someone who had power over them, yeah. to bow down That's right. before them, do obeisance to him. That's why God set this kingdom of God up during Rome, uh -huh. during Babylon, Medio Persian, Greece, Roman, they were all global kingdoms. Yeah. They were all global kingdoms. 
in the days of those kings, he set up that kind of kingdom, mm -hmm. except it was going to have dominion over all. Yeah. It was never going to fade away. Yeah. I'm going to venture out on a limb. I'm going to say that no one who only, only knows about our form of government has any idea what a kingdom is. They don't know what a king, they don't know what the kingdom of God is because they've got a different view of kingdom. God raised it up when there was a proper view of kingdom. Well, it's not the best form of government. God wanted to help Israel build a temple. He called for Cyrus, who was a world leader. Called for Nebuchadnezzar to do a work for him. Joseph's brethren came, bowed before him. Joseph, he makes himself strange to them. That is, he kind of appeared gruff. I get the picture, he kind of appeared gruff and they didn't rec couldn't recognize him. <laughs> he made himself strange. Now, they, he, these men hadn't seen Joseph for over 20 years. Now he went to he went to Egypt when he was seventeen. He took the throne when he was thirty, right? There had been seven years of plenty, that's thirty-seven. Uh -huh. And the seven years of famine were well in, so you're at least at ten. Uh -huh. yeah. So that'd be that'd be twenty years, I guess. Yeah. Twenty three or twenty four years since they'd seen him. Yeah. But God been working in the background all this all this time. So Joseph, he, he recognized him. <laughs> Among other things, this confirms that the, the phenomenal versatility of the saints of God. The ordinary person to see his brothers who'd sold him into slavery would have thrown him out of whack. Uh -huh. yeah. huh? yeah. they, they would have went berserk, maybe. <laughs> they couldn't have handled it, but he just yeah. calm, Handles it because he knew more than they knew, see? That's right. Well, you can imagine that dream. Yeah. yeah. Oh, as a boy, <laughs> yeah. that yeah. dream of the, of the shocks mm. and the sun, moon, and That's stars right. coming back to him at that moment yeah, yeah. Yes. as they bowed before him. <coughs> you remembered him. He may have right. been 11 or 12 or 13 years old when that happened. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he remembered him. Yeah. Recognized him right away. <coughs> they had certain manners about them that didn't, that didn't leave them. Uh -huh. It's good. For us to use our capacity of to recall, yes, amen. to recall the right things. <laughs> this is part of loving the Lord with all your mind, remembering, picking up from the past place where you can see God's hand in it, amen. and recalling it. So Joseph makes himself strange to them, disguises himself. Now God, I think God does this a lot of times. God disguises himself. He hides himself. The prophet Isaiah said he hides himself so that people can't tell it's him. And he said he spoke roughly to them. Gruffly. Cruel or severe. Now, have you ever thought of the many rough sayings that Jesus gave to his disciples? Huh? Let me give you some. He saith unto them, his disciples, O ye of, O, why are ye fearful, O ye of little faith? Do ye not yet understand that whatsoever entereth in at the mouth goeth into the belly and is cast out into the drought? Do ye not yet understand, neither remember the five loaves and five thousand, how many baskets he took up? How is it ye do not understand that I spake it not to you concerning bread, but that ye should beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees? Oh, Faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him to me. When he was come in, he said unto them, Why make ye all this ado and weep? The damsel is not dead, for it sleepeth. And when he was come in, he said unto them, Why make ye this ado and weep? The damsel is not dead, but sleepeth. Why reason, why reason ye, because ye have no bread? Perceive ye not, yet neither understand, have ye... Your heart yet hardened? And I won't read the rest of them, but those are some 
rough, <laughs> some rough sayings of Jesus. Paul had some too. Foolish Galatians. James, all oh, adulterers and adulteresses. When for the reason of time you ought to be teachers, you have someone need to teach you again the first rudiments. Gee, there's this rough talking that takes place. And Joseph asked him, he said, now where, where, are, you, where are you from? Where did you come from? They said, well, we came from Canaan to buy food. So I said that the land of Canaan was northwest, north, northeast, I think it was, northeast. And it was about 200 miles, so they come on quite a way. In the obtaining of spiritual nourishment, there's a parallel to this record with which we're dealing. It's a certain inconvenience associated with obtaining the truth. Have you not found it to be so? Those of you that have located truth, it, wasn't it there's some inconvenience connected with it? Yeah. But you proved that he really wanted it, see? Yeah, amen. Buy the truth, Solomon said, don't sell it. Mm -hmm. Don't sell it. So Joseph knew them, but they didn't know him. Now, there's a couple of reasons why maybe they didn't know him. Maybe their eyes were holding. They, maybe God made it impossible for them to see him, which I, I'm kind of inclined to think that's what happened. I prefer this because later, before they knew who Joseph was, about the time when they were thrown into, when they were thrown by Joseph into a pit, he heard his cries and they rehearsed that among themselves before they knew Joseph was really Joseph. See, they'd not forgotten Joseph. He tr yeah. tried. Now, a parallel circumstance exists concerning Christ. Although the prophets had prepared the people to recognize Jesus instantly when he came, when he came, they knew him not. He came to his own, his own received him not, even though they'd been tutored. But there were some that did. Philip said to Nathaniel, we found him, we found him, of whom Moses and the prophets, in, Moses and the prophets in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. We, we found him, see, they, That's right. they took advantage of the learning available to them. A few others said of him, when Christ cometh, will he do more miracles than these which this man hath done? So they, they couldn't conceive anybody yeah. doing more. In the midst of all this, Joseph remembered the dreams. <laughs> Amen. I can only imagine the multiplicity of thoughts that course through his mind as he recalled those dreams, remembered the dreams 20 years ago, more and more. His brothers, you remember, were seen as 12 sheaves of grain that bowed down before him and so forth. See, sometimes we are required to wait for a long time before we're vindicated. Mm -hmm. Jesus said, man ought always to pray and not to faint. Mm -hmm. See, then he gave the parable of that woman who prayed to the unjust judge. Mm -hmm. So all, uh, all affairs aren't ended instantly. Sometimes you have to wait That's right. to tarry. Amen. And he's going to try him a little bit. He said, you're spies. I know, you're spies. Your spies. He's testing them, see. He doesn't, unless God has revealed it to him, and I, I doubt that he had at this point, he doesn't know the character of these men now, whether they'd underwent some kind of a change or were softer, or, so you can put them to the test to see what comes out of them. Your spies, they say, oh no, we're, we're true men. We're, we're true men. We're honest men. But all this made no unfavorable impression on Joseph. Nay, he said, nay, you're, you're spies. That's a joy. You come to spy out the land. You come to find out if there's some weakness here in the land so you can exploit it. No, he said, thy servants were 12 brethren. They counted Joseph in there, see. He said, we're 12 brethren, the sons of one man in the land of Canaan. 
Notice the cunning way in which they referred to their family. Sir, there are actually 12 of us. Mm -hmm. We are your servants, are, are all brothers, sons of a man living in the land of Canaan. Our youngest brother is back there with our father right now, and one of our brothers is no longer with us. It's a new living translation. <laughs> See how kind of subtle they were yeah. mentioning that. Actually, they had no idea where Joseph was. So Joseph tells them, well, we're going to prove you now. Hereby shall you be proved or tested. I'm going to find out if you're spies or not. He says, though Joseph replied, what does you being members of a family with 12 sons, with one at home, have anything to do with buying corn in Egypt? i, I got to have more information than, than this. Younger, your youngest brother must come. Well, that didn't sit well with the brothers because they knew what their father's reaction was going to be with right. Joseph and all. You got to go home, bring him back. He put them all together in a ward, polite way to say prison, for three days. Do a little thinking, soul searching. This was a time of testing. For Joseph, it would confirm that his brothers had made some advance. Might be even consider now that they had treated him, they might consider how they treated him 20 years previously. So he didn't isolate them from one another, he put them together. He knew that was the best thing, uh, best thing to do. And Joseph said unto them, third day, this do and live, for I fear God. I fear God? Uh, apparently they didn't pick up on this. I fear God. Now it's interesting to compare what they said about themselves as compared to what Joseph said about himself. They said, we are true men. Yeah. Uh -huh. That's what we are. We're true, we're honest. We're honest men. Joseph said, I fear God. Notice how differently he spoke to them. Some years earlier, when yet in his teens, Joseph had expressed this same fear in another way to Potiphar's wife. He said, how can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? See? Yeah. So this wasn't like a new posture that he had. I fear God. Now, I won't go into it here, but this matter of fearing God... There's a lot, a lot to this that would bear your personal investigation, research, fearing God, what all that involves. Because a person who fears God won't, won't sin deliberately. Amen. They won't do it. They're actually afraid to do it. I fear God. But the fact that he said that to his brothers, it was a clue. That was a clue. They should have picked up on this. Fear God. This Egyptian, this is an Egyptian. Fear God. I fear God. I think I'll close there tonight. I, I'm not able to go ahead, but it's a marvelous text. I glory in being able to see the hand of God working in all of this. Everything's calm and serene in the heavenly places. There's no tumult or anything up there. He's just working these things out. Any of you have a word you'd like to add tonight? Yes, Brother Jason. I see a couple of parallels with, between Joseph, before, Joseph and his brothers and Christ and his brethren. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. Je Jesus came incognito. They didn't recognize who he was. And uh, they thought they'd gotten rid of him, too. Mm -hmm. But he lived. Yes. And he reigned. Mm -hmm. Yes. So here, Joseph's brothers, they thought they got rid of Joseph. Not only was Joseph alive, <laughs> he was ruling. Yeah. Yes. Amen. It's a picture of Christ. Mm -hmm. Amen. And, Je and Jesus came incognito, but he's going to reveal himself, just like, mm -hmm. just like Joseph revealed himself to his brothers. Yes. Amen. 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 You'll probably get into this later. 
but whenever Joseph sold the corn, he was actually buying up the people for Pharaoh. Yes, right. I know it. I know yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> yes, Buddha? You said that the world can give you nothing that lasts. <clears throat> Thought, as we are God's children, we share his traits because he is our father. Thought, the origin of something depicts what it gives you. It, Jesus said that a good fruit won't give you bad, and the other way around, a bad tree won't give you good fruit. So the, the world itself will not last. So how much less will the things that it can give be able to last? But God, who is exceeding, in his exceeding riches, he can give things that will never last, that will carry over into eternity. Amen. 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 All right, we'll have a word of prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this text. We thank you for your work with Joseph Amen. and how it projects us to the time of Christ and shows us a lot about our Savior. Help us to be in subjection to Christ as his brothers, Joseph's brothers were to him. We thank you for him that he's benevolent and gracious, full of mercy and truth. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Mm -hmm.